Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Courtney. I'm an alcoholic, and it's always an honor to be at an AA meeting and Courtney, have you. Oh, I'm you. sorry. That's okay. I'll put it down here. I'll put it right here. Um, it's always an honor to speak in an AA meeting, and um, and yeah, it's good to be here. My first time in Sandy Springs, <laughs> so I've been stuck in Alpharetta, um, but. Just to give you a little bit of background, my sobriety date is November 1st, 2005. I got sober when I was 21. Um, that was not too young for me. I am, I know down to my bones that I'm an alcoholic. Um, I also have drugs in my story. I mean, alcohol is a big thing, but drugs definitely sped up the process of the downward spiral. So, um, so, yeah, so I am from Kentucky, a really small town in Kentucky, population of about 5,000 in the county, one stoplight in the whole county, um, one public school, one school, public school. Um, there were 60 people in my graduating class. Um, so I grew up in a very small town, and I, you know, this is, I think, a ubiquitous feeling among alcoholics that you just never feel like you fully belong, no matter where you are, until you start to get comfortable in your own skin after you work the steps, you know, after being in these rooms, that's been my experience. So I don't think it's, you know, any mystery that I didn't really feel part of in the community I grew up in. And, um, you know, I was always an anxious kid and there was some stuff going on in my home that I think facilitated addiction and, um, you know, just some things that I had to work through with outside help after, before sobriety and after sobriety. And um, there's a lot of alcoholism in my family. I definitely think that this is a family disease. And um, from what I've seen in my own family, um, you know, I've had several family members just completely alcoholic and addicted. We've had three family members who have taken their own lives completely due to alcoholism and drugs and, uh, and depression and, um, all the, I think all the things that come with untreated alcoholism. Um, and you know, I have a cousin right now who it's hard to watch, you know, it's really hard to watch because she's been struggling with alcoholism and addiction for 30 years. And, you know, she's been, I can see the opportunities have presented themselves to her to get better. And she absolutely refuses to look at her part and, her life and choose to be a victim. And I'll get to that kind of victim. The the victim thing is part of my story and how I worked through that. I'll get to that later. But, you know, when I see that in my own family, I'm so grateful that I had the steps and wonderful sponsors that were able to break the chains for me around some of that thinking. So, um, I am the all, I have an aunt and uncle who are also in the program, but they don't really go to meetings that much anymore. Um, I am the only one who is, you know, goes to meetings consistently. So I grew up in this community and this family. I had supportive parents, but they were very much in denial about dysfunction in my home. And, um, and as long as everything looked good on the outside, we were good to go. I think that's, um, a little bit of a Southern thing as well. Um, I grew up Southern Baptist, which I guess could just explain my alcoholism in a nutshell. <laughs> but, but my parent, you know, my parents weren't super, super religious. They, you know, we went to church and all of that. But it was that kind of community. Um, so you, everything had to have a pretty face. Everything had to look good from the outside. And who cared what was going on on the inside? You couldn't really talk about it. Um, so growing up, I was very anxious. I was very nerdy. Um, and, and comfortable, you know, I think I was okay with that. I was classical pianist all, you know, I started piano when I was three or four, very serious about that. Very serious child. Um, very okay being alone. I've always been an isolator, very comfortable with that, but being just by myself. Um, but then when I got to middle school, high school, I started to notice that I was like very uncool. So I think like overnight I was 14 or 15, I quit piano, which I'd done since I was three or four. 
um, I quit the band and I was, I was like all state, you know, first chair, all state this and all, I really succeeded. If I could have stuck with that, I would have probably had, you know, scholarships and through the piano as well. I dropped all of that overnight, uh, became a cheerleader and got a boyfriend. <laughs> so I just had to change my image completely. And I started drinking, um, because I felt so uncomfortable in my own skin. Um, and, and I really, you know, I had to drink. Um, I mean, I basically had to drink to just tolerate all of the new things that I had brought into my life um, just because I wanted to fit in. But at the end of the day, I didn't drink because I wanted to fit in. I drank because I'm an alcoholic and I have a sip of alcohol and I have to have more. Um, I am an alcoholic the way they describe in the doctor's opinion, for sure. Um, I have an allergy and, and I, and I know that about myself. So, um, so anyway, high school drinking, smoking pot, whatever college, I can't even handle my drinking. I'm going to fraternity parties and I don't even know what's going on. I, I, I don't even have any memories from like my first, I don't think I got through my first semester of college. I had to take a medical leave after two months because I was drinking so much and, um, having, suicidal episodes, um, after I was drinking, um, I ended up in a psych ward twice from that. So, um, so the drinking, it did alleviate some of that anxiety, depression, but I was always taken down by the drinking along with the anxiety and depression. Um, so, so yeah, I did not make it through my first semester of college. Um, and then, excuse me. And so, this just kept going on and on and on. Then I found the hard substances. I won't talk very much about drugs, but just to give you an idea of what I was doing by the time I was 19 years old, at any given 72-hour period, I was on four or five different substances um, because I would use certain substances to stay up and have to use other substances to come down. And um, I was, you know, it's I wasn't using heroin, but I was using um, Oxycontin and cocaine, which is basically speedballing. Um, and so that sort of drug behavior took me down really, really quickly. Um, mm. I was, I had transferred to the University of Louisville. I was living alone. I was pretending to go to college. I, my parents would pay the tuition. Um, and then I would buy like tons of books, hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of books take them back to the bookstore, get that money, withdraw from the classes, get that money, not go to school, spend all of that money on drugs and alcohol. Um, my parents were helping me with rent. I was um, spending all of that money that I was supposed to use for rent and utilities on drugs and alcohol. I was two hours, this was two, about two and a half hours away from my hometown. And um, I would, you know, I would really need money to um, need money for my habits. So I would say, oh, I'm going to go home and visit my parents. I'm going to steal from them, but I'm going to go home and stay. I'm going to stay the night. I'm going to stay like a minimum of eight hours so that, you know, that I'm, they think I'm spending time with them. I would get there. I would drive the two-hour drive. I would get into my parents' home. I would, you know, write a check to myself or whatever. My parents are not wealthy people. I mean, this is, it's not like they would not notice this. It was just that I was, I was a thief and this is what I did. Um, and I didn't care about the consequences. I knew they would know because we, we don't have enough money to, for them to not know. Um, so I would steal from them and as soon, I would be there for 10 minutes and as soon as I would have it in my hands, I could not stay another minute because it was like I was having, I had alcohol and drugs in my hands when I had that cash in my hands. And I would immediately get back into the car and drive the two and a half hours back to Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so this kind of behavior went on. <clears throat> my parents, um, you know, I think they knew it was going on. They were very afraid to see the reality of it. Um, so I think that they did the best they could with me. They just did not know how to help me. And they enabled me. I mean, that they just didn't know any other way. So I don't think it was their intention for me to, you know, be on death's door from drugs and alcohol. It's just they didn't, they didn't know how to help me. And they didn't know anything about 12-step programs. Um, so, so this went on and on. And I was doing more and more, you know, just crazier, crazier stuff. Um, 
And so I went to my first treatment center the beginning of 2005. Um, that was unsuccessful. I, I wasn't, I didn't want to be sober. The second I wouldn't have alcohol in my system and I would kind of come to reality, it's just life was so painful. It's like you either want to, you, you can't stop using and drinking, but then if you stop, you feel like you're going to kill yourself. So it's just like you couldn't, I couldn't come to and be okay. Um, so I left that treatment center, immediately went back to what I was doing. Um, and I really didn't care if I lived or died. I didn't care if I was caught. I, did, I didn't care about consequences at all. Health, family, friends, I just had to drink and I had to use. Um, I felt like an animal when it came. It, I, it was so animalistic the way that I wanted drugs and alcohol. Um, so it's funny that that's what alcoholism reduces us to. And then you get sober and you see the way you feel and that you're this very, you know, this person, what we're capable of when we get sober and you, and you think about that time and you think how primal and animalistic it is to be an active alcoholism. It's, um, it's very scary. And, um, it's, it's, um, it's, I feel grateful that I have that perspective, but I don't always stop and think about it. So it's, you know, it's always good to tell my story and hear my story for that reason. Um, so obviously that treatment center didn't work. I went to another treatment center out in Arizona, um, still the same sort of behavior. I was signed myself out, you know, against medical advice again. Um, finally, my parents were just so, my parents were so fed up and scared uh, my mom was ready to, my mom and dad are very happily married. They just celebrated like 43 years of marriage. I've never seen them fight, which is probably dysfunctional that I've never seen my parents raise their voice at each other. But, um, but they have a very happy marriage. Um, and this was, you know, they'd been married, I guess, 32 years at this time. And my mom was ready to leave my dad if she found out he even gave me like $20 for gas money or something. So that's kind of the shape I got my family into. I was affecting others a lot um, in my family. And um, so, you know, they were they really didn't know what else to do. They said there's this treatment program in Florida that we know about that has been very successful. And you're going to go there and you're going to stay there a year and you're going to be sober for a year and then we'll speak to you. And then we can talk about being a family again. So out of fear, you know, I just didn't know what else to do. I just agreed um, because I was just so fearful that I wouldn't be. I didn't have any other choices, really. Um, and I was terrified of not being financially supported by my family. So I agreed to go. So that was my mom and I got on the plane, um, Halloween 2005, and she accompanied me down to Florida, this treatment center in Florida. It was an outpatient treatment center, and I had been introduced to AA in another treatment center, but it was just a meeting in the treatment center, and it's like, you know, it's hard to connect that to real life AA. Um, it's hard to say, oh, this is how I'm going to, you know, how I'm going to live my life when I get out of this treatment center. So I was in an outpatient treatment center, and um, one of the things that I'm most grateful for about that place is that um, we had to go to a 6.30 a.m. AA meeting every single morning, on, you know, and on top of extra meetings we would go to during the day. So it kind of forced me to get up, be an adult for the first time in my life, go to an AA meeting, you know, I would go to somebody's house for, bre you know, sober people's houses for breakfast or whatever. I would go, you know, in the beginning, I would go to the treatment facility and like pretty much be, you know, in their groups all day or therapy or whatever, you know, have lunch with sober people, have dinner, go to groups, have dinner with sober people, go to a meeting. So it was just like, that's all my life was for pretty much the first whole year of my sobriety. And I needed that because I was just... I was so broken. I had no idea how to, I just didn't know how to even do basic things. Um, and just to give you an idea, you know, when I got there, I was, I'm totally unrecognizable from, you know, before I got sober. I think, you know, my hair was falling out. I was definitely like, didn't have any color in my face. I was 
about 20, well, a much less weight than I am now with the baby, but um, I was gaunt, I was malnourished, I would just was totally unrecognizable from then. But um, so I was, you know, I had a lot, I had a lot of um, rehabilitation to go through, I guess, um, physically, mentally, emotionally, and what I later found to find out is spiritually. I just didn't know that when I was first getting sober. So um, back to the AA meeting when I when I first um, in my first few months, you know, I was I met a lot of really really good women who just showed me the way. It, in the meeting, I got sober, and it was definitely men with the men, women with the women. Um, I met a lot of good women, got a sponsor right away. I didn't know what the heck I was doing working the steps, but it didn't matter because my sponsor just had to say, do this, and I had to say, okay. Yeah. I was desperate enough to do whatever my sponsor suggested. Also, I would think I was just, I really wanted out of there, so I was people-pleasing like crazy, which I guess served me well for the wrong reasons in the beginning, but then... You know, it got it. I stayed and I followed directions for that reason. And then that's when my perspective started to shift a little later. So I think some of these little selfish and manipulative things that I did in early sobriety, it didn't matter. It was keeping me in the rooms and it was keeping me around sober people. And I could look back and say, okay, I'm glad I got out of that phase of my thinking and early sobriety so that I actually, it's like going to meetings because you have to. And then all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're like, oh my gosh, I want to be in meetings because I want to, because I like meetings. Um, this is working for me. So it was kind of that sort of shift in perspective. Um, so in early sobriety, it's early sobriety for me was really tough. Um, I think it's tough for a lot of people. Um, you're physically with, you know, withdrawing from alcohol and drugs, you know, you're, you feel, I felt crazy, like I just didn't even know how to do basic things, like I didn't know how to make coffee, I didn't know how to, you know, I just didn't know how to do anything, I didn't know how to dress, you know, appropriately for a job, I, I just didn't know basic things. Um, I had never lived life as an adult. I immediately got out of high school and was, you know, drinking the way that I did, so I had no life skills. <laughs> Um, but I thought that I was really, really, really smart, much smarter than any, any anyone who was telling me what to do in the rooms. I think I went through the big book in the 12 and 12 in my first two weeks, and I picked out, like, every single grammatical error and, like, every single inconsistency. And I was like, this is why this thing is it doesn't work. And, and I, it's just like people would just roll their eyes and be like, okay, keep coming back. Um, so I, um, you know, I'm glad I don't remember much of what I said in meetings when I was newly sober. But now when I hear newcomers, you know, it helps me so much. So it helps me have compassion for myself, too, because, you know, it's like we all relate to that. We all relate to being in that place. And the love that I have for someone counting days or just coming in um, you know, you can't really explain that to the outside world of, you know, loving someone you don't even know, but we get to experience that here. So the way that I feel about, you know, someone just coming into the rooms or counting days, um, helps me to know why people put their hand out to me when I was new, because it helps them so much. And it's really a miracle to be on the journey with somebody getting sober. Um, so so, yeah, I think that my brain started to finally clear up a little bit at two years sober. Uh, I remember not being able to, like, read read something and comprehend it properly and tell you what it said for a while. I think my brain was really um, fried from everything I had been doing. Um, of course, I never finished college, um, so that's something I, you know, did in sobriety. But just back to the steps. So the first time I worked through the steps, I think it was very um, robotic because I didn't really understand what I was doing, but I know I felt relief. When they say in the big book and, you know, with the fourth and fifth step at the end of isolation, um, that was a huge shift for me because, you know, I had been to therapists or psychiatrists or whatever and, you know, maybe told them things about my life, but I never had intimacy with those people. It wasn't until I had my first sponsor that I did a fourth and fifth step with her 
And, you know, I thought it was going to be this big dramatic thing. And she was, she was just so easygoing and she's like, okay, I relate to this and I relate to that. And okay, let's go walk my dog now. And, you know, it just like, wasn't a big deal. She didn't let me get dramatic about it. She didn't let me like, I think that there's a lot of fear about writing the fourth step and then sharing it. And I think, you know, what, that's a big deal because that was really the first time I had trusted another human being in that way. But then when you kind of go through it and you see that the share in the fifth step is so much, it's so much bigger than just about me and my story. It's, it's like a connection I feel with another person and a safety, um, that, you know, sort of solidifies a relationship I have in AA. You, you kind of, you see the, you start to see the bigger picture there. So I definitely had that experience. I had relief from my fourth and fifth step. Um, like I said, I had trust in another person, real intimacy with another person for the first time in my life, an intimacy with a woman um, in AA, something I had never experienced with my own mother um, or my sister, which was huge. And, um, and, you know, continuing on through the steps, kind of, you know, looking at six and seven and Um, you know, my sponsor would say separating the, um, girls from the women, um, and, you know, starting to look at that harder stuff. It was like, okay, how am I affected now that I'm not drinking? You know, if I don't change, I'm going to be the same person who was drinking. And I think that's when some really tough work comes into the picture of, okay, what are all these behaviors I'm doing that are going to take me out? Um, of being a victim was a big thing for me. You know, I had had stuff happen in my home, and then I was um, assaulted. I was sexually assaulted when I was 18, um, which really perpetuated my drugs and drugs and alcohol. Um, did not press charges for that. I think sitting in that silence, I pretty much had to use and drink just to, like, deal with all the stuff, you know, that you did. There's so many young women, I think, that go through that who don't fully, you know, out of fear or whatever, they don't get to deal with stuff. Um and, and I'm, I'm glad that's, you know, it took me years to get to forgiveness around that. Um, but I think that I'm so grateful that I've had every single experience I've had so that I can help other women and, um, and be able to just like be okay with, you know, that's my story and that's what it is. And, um, so, you know, coming from experiences like that also, you know, you know, just experiences you have when you're drinking, you, you know, there's just degrading, debauched things that happen when you're active. And so I needed some therapy on some, you know, some things, but I felt very victimized by those experiences. And, you know, there were some things where you're like, you know, when you look at stuff in childhood or you look at something where you didn't have control over what was going on, um, you think, oh, you know, I can never get to forgiveness for this which is okay right then, but then you have to think, okay, how is this attitude serving me in my life? Just because maybe I don't have a part in this, does that mean that I get to use these feelings to, um, to not show up for life? And I'm so grateful that I had women who, who didn't really allow me to use those feelings to not show up and not to get better. Um, I see a lot of people stuck in that. Like I said, I have a family member who's stuck in that sort of mentality. She's gone through horrible trauma in her life. Um, and you know, maybe her, you know, maybe my anger was justified or my not forgiving was justified, but how was that serving me? And how was that serving the people in my life today that I truly love and want to bring into my life? And it wasn't. And so I had to do a lot of work on letting all of that go. And that was a huge turning point. And that's been something I've had to work on year after year after year in different ways. Um, And that really the steps set us free. God, what I choose to call God, God sets me free. And, um, and then I get to live the life I have today and I get to feel comfortable in my skin and I get to feel safe with people or um, I get to know what true love is, true intimacy with others all through the steps and through my higher power. And I think that's just absolutely incredible. Nothing else has given me that but AA. Um, All of that kind of spiritual stuff for me starts with AA. 
and I can use other things to get to where I need to be, whether that be outside help or, you know, church or whatever, but it has to start in this room and it has to start with doing the work on myself, being able to help others and being consistent in my AA life with meetings and, you know, step work and all of that. So, um, so getting through the steps, you know, I finished the steps, you know, for the first time in early sobriety, but I've worked them, you know, numerous times after that. Um, and in different ways I had, diff- you know, all kinds of issues I had to deal with and other, you know, other 12 step programs. I had to deal with food stuff and, you know, relationship stuff and alcohol, but it's all, it's all this, it's all big book. Um, but you can, I feel like the steps are great for applying to other areas in our lives where there might be dysfunction. I definitely had dysfunction in other areas. So, um, because I can't really be sober and engaging in other addictive behaviors and be sober. I just, I can't do that. So, um, you know, I had good people in my life who were very thorough with me in those ways. Um, so, you know, I think when I was two or three years sober, I, um, I was taking like some community college courses just to like get used to being in a classroom again. And so I transferred to a a call after that, after I took like a couple classes just to get used to like, okay, I can sit in this room and I can read this book and I can retain what I'm reading. Um, I went back to a four year college and, um, I got my bachelor's in classical piano performance. So I went back to the piano. Um, I hadn't played since I was 15. I'd played, but I hadn't performed. I hadn't had the discipline to practice the way that's required for that sort of field in a very long time. Um, And so that was tough. I had a lot of fear. Again, the steps helped me through all that fear. Um, I had people, you know, say, you know, you can't, you know, who knows? I feel like work is work is work. But I think that when there are things that allow you to be of service to other people, you have to like kind of embrace those things about yourself. And I think music is that for me. And so, you know, I was supported just to, you know, push through that fear, you know, go for it, not worry about what the outcome was. Um, so I finished school and got my bachelor's in classical piano performance, you know, and did the big recital at the end. And, you know, those are just things I never thought I could do. Um, you know, graduated magna cum laude. Like I was like, I, it's, you know, that school's really not that bad when you're not drinking. Like it's really not that, it's, you know, college can be hard, but it's nothing compared to when you're trying to juggle your party lifestyle and get to class and cram for exams. Oh, I crammed for plenty of exams sober because procrastination is a problem for me, but still it's not the same. Um, it's actually not that bad when you're actually present, um, and doing what you're supposed to do. So, um, so I got my bachelor's, I was in this, like, where I got sober, I I used to not talk about this very much until I had a few years, but until I had some distance and could kind of reflect on this place, but I'm so grateful for my time, you know, in that outpatient treatment facility, but it was also like a therapeutic community. Um, so it's like people would get sober there and they would stay in the community for like 20 or 30 years. And that's what works to them. That's fun. Beautiful meetings there, you know, wonderful meetings there. Everything helped me tremendously, but there was always this fear of doing something wrong. Like if you weren't living life perfectly, um, it's like in order, you felt like when you were young, a lot of the people in my age group felt like you almost had to have a reason to leave. So I feel like there were some kind of like cultish things about the community, but it got me sober and it, and it got me healthy in a lot of different ways. And it helped me with a lot. So I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm grateful for my time there, but you know, I had some things to work out. So, um, I, um, when I was thinking about grad school, I was, I thought, you know, I picked grad school for two reasons. And I, I saw this in, you know, just a few years ago. So I wanted to go to grad school and continue my music studies, you know, first and foremost, that was important to me. I had a lot of support from my professors and my bachelor's program to do that. Secondly, I thought I had to have a reason to leave this place in Florida. And you know, that was really interesting for me to see about myself, that there was a whole part of myself and my sobriety where I wasn't being 100% honest and 
and could just be who I was and say, this is what I want for myself and go after it. Um, so I didn't see that really until later, but, um, but I did apply to grad school and I ended up going to grad school in New York city, which is where I met Chris. And so, um, you know, New York AA, it, it's, it was exactly what I needed at the time. I was five years sober when I moved up there. I was um, starting my graduate program. I felt like, you know, I have a little bit of a handle on life. And the meetings up there are great. You can basically go to a meeting any hour of the day, um, any day of the week. Um, the accessibility is just awesome. I found a great home group right away. I found a great sponsor right away. But coming from this place where I had sponsors kind of like tell me what to do at every turn, I found this woman, you know, she had like 29 years at the time I got there. I really liked her. She didn't speak a lot in meetings, but she just had this energy and she was always there. She was always in the meetings. So consistent. Um, the sweetest energy, but also, you know, when I did hear her speak, she just had such a strong message. And I thought, I want this woman to be my sponsor. So, you know, I asked this woman to be my sponsor. Pam, she's still my sponsor. And, um, and you know, she, she just had a different energy. I, I never really encountered that hadn't been my experience with sponsors. And I would have a crisis or whatever. And I would want her to tell me what to do so badly. I just wanted an answer. She wouldn't give it to me. She would say, you know, I don't have experience with that. You know, you might want to ask, you know, my grand sponsor has, or my sponsor has experience with that. Ask my sponsor, or, you know, I'm sorry. I, you know, I can't tell you what to do. Why don't you pray about it? Pray about it. I had never had a sponsor really say, hey, pray about it. I had sponsors say, um, you need to do this about that. Have this, say exactly this thing in this conversation with this person. And, and I think in early sobriety, I needed that kind of guidance, but as I, I needed to become more comfortable with myself as I got more sober. So this woman, you know, I was thinking about just like the third. I think that she introduced me to what it really meant to be in the third step and to trust God. She really upped my spiritual um, program in that way. Um, she helped me not be attached to outcomes. She always directed me to turn to my higher power when I was going through stuff. So this is a I mean, I, it's almost like when I found her, you know, life started to become a little uncomfortable for those reasons because I didn't have any answers. But at the same time, I start to feel what it really meant to trust God. And, you know, some of the, the reasons that I feel that sobriety is worth it. And I don't think I could really understand that before five years, just for me. Um, I had a lot of stuff to work through. So... So New York was great in that way. I met a lot of, you know, I have so many women that are just my closest friends from my time in Florida. I think the experience we went through together down there just, you know, we'll always have an incredible bond. You know, we got married in September and, you know, those three women were my, you know, bridesmaids. And, you know, when I'm with them, we don't miss a beat. It's really wonderful. We've been friends for, you know, 11 years. And, um... And in New York, I have the same experience. I have so many friendships from AA, and I have this wonderful sponsor, and I have some wonderful, I've had wonderful sponsees over the years. Um, I was thinking about doing step work and how working with sponsees really allows me to, you know, continue that step work at all times, even if I'm not actively, as of like right now, I'm not actively working the steps with my own sponsor. Um, but then I've gone through two rounds of steps with my sponsee in the past year and how healing that is for me. Cause it's like, you know, I try to work the steps with her as she's working the steps and, um, I always grow more from that. And, um, and I'm still figuring out like, you know, what do I do down here? I have my sponsor who I can't imagine letting go of right now. We have an incredible relationship and we talk a lot, you know, but, you know, maybe I'll find I need somebody down here where I can have FaceTime with them, and, and I'll find that out. But um, for right now, you know, it's okay. And I, I have, have some really great women in my home group. But it's hard, you know, it, when you have a long relationship with someone, especially with a sponsor, um, you know, it's hard for me just to see her as another person in AA. And I know that at the end of the day, that's what it is sometimes. But, 
you know, those relationships are really, you know, they become really special and they become really deep. So, um, I love her and, um, you know, she's, she's helped me through so much in the past five years. So, um, in New York, I, um, I, um, so I went to grad school. I finished that program just recently. I took a break to work in New York and can't live in New York without having a real job. Um, it's impossible. So I had to take some time off and work. And I had one last project to do, which was my master's recital, which is like 75 to 90 minutes of like totally solo on stage, memorized. I mean, your bachelor's program is like that too, but it's shorter and it's different sort of repertoire and, you know, skill level and whatever. So I couldn't work and prepare all that. Um, so I worked for four years, took two years off from my master's program. And then finally the time came where I said, okay, I got to leave this corporate job, full-time corporate job because I've got to finish this program because we were thinking about moving. So I quit my job and I just started practicing about 25 to 30 hours a week starting last, um, last September. And so I did that, and then my recital was just this past April, April 2016. So, um, I mean, just, I was thinking about the discipline and all of that. That is so not me. It's, it's all the changes that AA has allowed me to make in my life and, and the support I get to push through fear. And um, I'm so lazy. I'm so inherently, like, if I could just be at home and do nothing all day long, I would. Like if I had no, like I, I know that I wouldn't be happy that way, but I can easily just be at home and literally like do nothing all day and feel okay with that. I know that doesn't work in the long run, but, um, I'm inherently lazy. I'm inherent, I'm inherent procrastinator. So some of these behaviors that are the antithesis of my true nature is all from AA, um, and the support I get in here. So yeah, that was really scary. And I would share in meetings and, you know, I hadn't been on stage. I'd taken two years off. I hadn't been on stage to perform, um, like that in a couple years. And I had to talk about it in, in the rooms and, um, like stuff like that is how my alcoholism shows up. Um, fear, anxiety, I'm not really an angry person. I've never been terribly in touch with my anger, but I'm extremely anxious. I can be incredibly self-centered in my anxiety. I can be incredibly self-centered in fear. So I'm always having to work through that sort of stuff. It's all alcoholism. So, you know, I could let... Alcoholism can stop me from doing a million things that I know I'm capable of doing and that um, I should be doing. And I really have to work hard to get through that stuff relationships are another huge thing. You know, I've never had an easy time with friendships and, you know, having relationships and all that. That's another thing that's just can be, I can become absolutely consumed with self-centeredness and fear. Um, and I've had to have help to get through that stuff. So, um, so I finished my master's program. I finished that Magna Cum Laude day this past May, um, and had a really successful recital Um, and that, all of that stuff is an exercise of just like letting go and trusting God and just working hard and putting one foot in front of the other. And it's not because, you know, I can have a vision of what anything's going to be. It's just, I have to put one foot in front of the other and do the next right thing. And because if I start to worry about the outcomes, I'm going to make myself crazy. I can't really, I can't really live life that way. I have no business living life that way. So after that, Chris and I made a decision that it was time to leave New York, and um, I was ready to be closer to my family. I was really tired of living in Manhattan, and um, so we moved to, we did some research. We came down here once. We loved it. We came down here another time. We felt certain we picked out an apartment, um, and we just took the leap and, and got right down here. One of the first things we did was go to a home group in Alpharetta, and we liked it. And okay, this is this is good. So, well, we, there's a meeting here that we actually like. Um, that's that's my home group in Alpharetta, and um, and so we moved down here, and um, we just got plugged in in AA right away. And of course, we had each other, which was great. And um, 
And, you know, I'm sure, I think probably Chris shared this, you know, well, he did share it when we, when he was introducing me, but I met him in New York through our home group, um, up there. And, you know, we just have a beautiful network of friends and family. And, um, I stay out of his program. He stays out of mine. (laughs) Um, the second I start to, you know, take anybody's inventory, I'm not in a good place, especially in my partner, my husband. Um, and he does a really good job of just letting me be me and do what I do. But, you know, I also know, I also have the confidence that if I started to feel, if I started to appear off, I think Chris would tell me, um, I have people in my life who will let me know. So I don't have to stray too far away from the beam. And, um, and so, and then sometimes I can tell him, sometimes I have to watch myself you know, I was on the way here, I was fussing about the way he was driving, and I was like, okay, I guess this is how, you know, my, this is me being an alcohol. this is me acting alcoholically, um, when I focus on, you know, you yeah, know, that's true, but, um, but, you know, I was thinking about how I can get very snappy, you know, I can just like, really, so I have to watch that, especially with my husband, and, um, <laughs> And so I have to, you know, I always, I just have to be vigilant about that stuff. And, um, so, you know, I'm loving living here. The meetings are great. I'm doing what I like to do. I'm a piano teacher. Um, I haven't been able to get a, you know, perform cause I've been, I'm expecting and I can't really make commitments right now. So, um, but I'll get back to that. And, um, and I just do everything that I enjoy doing. I just have, you know, my little ways of my little, jobs and projects that I do and I don't have to really sell myself out and um you know I of course I have a lot of we have financial fear all the time and and also that's another thing where I just have to like let it go it's like okay I'm putting one foot in front of the other and um and for today it's okay and I just have to let go and we have a loving family and we have a lot of friends and you know life is going to be okay we have a baby on the way. We were very excited about that. Um, I can't wait to be a mother. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, I don't know what the future holds, but, I, but I've but i seen, you know, my sponsor and her husband, they met when they were a couple years sober. And, you know, they've been married for 29 years now, and they have four beautiful sons. And Um, it's just, it's just a beautiful thing. And I, I've been able to see, you know, their sons and see how they've been affected by having two sober parents. And, you know, I can't wait. I hope that that will be our experience as well. And, um, you know, life is good and I'm just really grateful to be here. And, um, you know, I'm, it's 946. I don't think I have much else to say. Um, I'm just so grateful to be here and, um, to, you know, to be in a room full of alcoholics and, and know that, you know, no matter what's going on, I can always find unconditional love and unconditional support in the rooms of AA, um, that I can look in the eyes of someone I've never met before and feel understood. And, um, and I think that's just such a wonderful thing. And I'm a, and I'm a very satisfied customer, as they say. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.